Now, Dr. Roger, you mentioned something uh, just then about classes, about how the Marxism uh, talks about classes. That kind of leads us into our next topic, you know, talking about classes, the the top class of them all, I suppose, the queen, right? Like she, you know, in all classes, it, you know, queen always rules. Well, on the chessboard, the queen rules anyway. Um <laughs> We couldn't do the. We couldn't do an episode talking about influential leaders and talking about you know, you know, people that that have you know, you know, influenced culture, especially, and not talk about the Queen, especially considering now you're probably seeing this a number of weeks later because we rec- we pre-record these a uh, number of weeks in advance, so you know it's probably old news by now. But it just happened a couple of days ago, you know, our, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, and. So we couldn't go by without talking about her because there's so much there's so much controversy. It's amazing how many people have come out and used this as a way to trample and speak negativity about, you know, I've seen quotes of like, well, she was a, a, a rapist murderer and all this sort of stuff. And just like, just because the monarchy stands for all this, it's like, she's a human being. Like, let, let's, let's, let's look at that first of all. And, and she's made, let's be honest, she's had a positive impact on the world. And, and so I was just talking to someone today at the gym and they were like, oh, what do you think about the queen dying? Like she was all this, all this bad stuff. I'm like, look, like she may have stood for, she may have been a part of some things that weren't all that great, but a part of a system that weren't, but she definitely did a lot of good. And so we wanted to, to take this moment to, well, let's say honor her and, and, and pray that, that, uh, that she's in a beautiful resting place sitting at the feet of Jesus right now. Wouldn't that be amazing? I, I believe that, uh, she does represent something that, that, uh, that would that would lead to that, I suppose. But I want to pass to Dr. Rod, but before I do, I just want to, there was a section of an article that I read and I did a bunch of research about her passing and, and everything like that. And there was one thing that really stood out to me, this just little, little story of, you know, you see this queen and you, she's the monarch and she's the, you know, like representative of this negative culture and all this sort of stuff. But as a teenager, she served as a mechanic. As a teenager, she served as a mechanic in World War II. Now, at this time, I think she was she was already like part of the the crown or whatever, or like you know, uh, like because she was at sixteen or something like that when she was first. You know, I, I'll pass to you, Doctor Rob, because you have all, all of the details. But you know, in World War II, she served as a mechanic. She drove a car, and she she was she was part of the war efforts. And then this is I, I saw this, and it was amazing. She saved her wartime rations so that she could save up and pay for her wedding dress for her wedding. Now, isn't that amazing that the Queen of England, they have all this wealth, but even she was a person, she was part of the royal family, and I think even at that stage she was you know, in line for the throne or on the throne or whatever it was, um, but she still served and drove. And actually, I, I heard this this crazy story that she um, took the prince of of Saudi Arabia and she actually took him for a drive because obviously they're anti women drivers and she like like you just hear these the little stories and you're like she was more than just this this queen figure that that you know this prim and proper you know queen figure she she served she served her country in war. And instead of putting a financial burden on the country and the re- financial resources of the country for her wedding, you know, you know she's she's a princess and, and a queen or whatever, you know, like like the, you're having the big royal wedding. Um, she chose to save up her own ration, rations to to be able to pay for um, for the uh, for a wedding dress. You know, having the longest the longest ever. Um, reign on a throne uh, in history over 70 years. That's absolutely incredible. Dr. Rod, what do you feel like we could learn from this? I don't know. I, I, I still see her as a little old lady, but she was a lot more than that. What can we learn from her in, in leadership? Well, I think we can actually learn quite a lot. And uh, I know some incredibly negative and um, 
absolutely ignorant comments have been made about her, which um, actually makes me quite angry. Yeah. Not so much that the statements were made, but some stupid people in the media thought they were worth actually broadcasting. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, look, I have no doubt that she's, she's certainly in heaven today. There's no doubt about that. She had a very deep faith. And, look, I think one of the reasons why she was able to maintain her role for just over 70 years was because she had a very deep faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of the more sensible commentators who take a more nuanced view of history and the role of her uh, as, a, as a monarch, they've made a lot of comments about how resilient she was, how committed mm. to serving the people she was, um, Perhaps not many people are aware of how important she was in the the um, the instigation, the development, and the continuation of the Commonwealth of Nations in this post-empire period. Well, she didn't believe in empire, but she did so, believe in a strong Commonwealth of Nations. So, t- so tell tell me about that, the Commonwealth of Nations, because you know some people don't actually quite understand what the Commonwealth is actually. Yeah, you know, because there'll be people all over the world watching this, but. Yeah, even people in Australia don't quite understand what the Commonwealth is. So obviously England, you know, colonised a bunch of nations around but then obviously drew back the rule of of the the, the royal family, et cetera, but still maintained control. And what, what does that mean for all those countries? Um, well, actually, they didn't maintain control. I think that was the whole point of this shift from empire to, to the Commonwealth of Nations. And and the truth be told, it started probably after World War I, and um, that's when a lot of nations felt that they wanted uh, independence. When we come down to World War II, the momentum, I think, uh, increased. But my understanding is that Queen Elizabeth did not have a desire to see the empire continue. As a Christian, she believed in equality of all people before God. Uh, She didn't believe that one nation should necessarily, as it were, rule over others. And my understanding is that the the Commonwealth was largely her idea. Uh, She worked very, very hard to establish it after she came to the throne in 1952. She spent a lot of time visiting the countries that are now members of the Commonwealth. And for her, it was something which was very important in her life. And she gave a lot of time and energy to the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth is actually essentially a voluntary grouping of nations that have that common history that uh, the the British either colonised them or, or they one way or other became a protectorate of, um, of uh, the UK or, or Great Britain as we know it. Craig, I wonder how many people are aware of her actual title. Um, and maybe you could indulge me and let me read it out. This is her Please. official legal title. Go for it. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. Now, she took all of those roles seriously, and she did believe that it was by the grace of God. King Charles III, as he now is, in his very first speech as the new king, he quoted from her 21st birthday address. This is what he quoted this is princess elizabeth in 1947 saying my whole life whether it be long or short shall be devoted to your service Mm. and that was an address to the people now he didn't say these important words and i think it's a bit significant that he left these off but she went on to say this god help me to make good my vow Mm. So she was very well aware, and and there was some untelevised parts of her coronation service where she was anointed with oil, she was prayed over by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and the prayer was that the Holy Spirit would anoint her and empower her for for this role. 
Uh, that was all done privately. She wore a simple white dress, no crown, no jewels. And um, she was anointed, as I said, and she was prayed over. She also spent nearly a month prior to her coronation working through a series of devotions and prayers that had been prepared for her wow. by the Archbishop of Canterbury. So she really took this role very seriously. And lots of commentators have been able to reel off long lists of all her positive qualities. And often they add, and she was a woman of deep faith. Yeah. But actually my belief, and I actually preached on this just last weekend, my belief is that all of those positive qualities were the result of her very strong faith. Her faith wasn't just something we add to that list mm -hmm. of qualities. Her faith was the very reason why she was able to exhibit those qualities over 70 long years as Queen Elizabeth II. So we, we let's, you know, look, it's great to be able to honour her and be able to actually share, you know, the, the good parts, et cetera. Um, you know, she, she had major influence. We, we we have to admit that that even though her her role was more of a symbolic role, um, you know, you know, I heard heard a quote saying that she actually oversaw thirteen prime ministers. You know, like imagine seeing that thirteen your know, leaders come and go and come and go, and you stay steadfast all through their controversy, all through their whatever, like and. I think it's incredible that, you know, obviously on our theme today, talking about culture, you know, obviously they were, you know, she was actually part of, you know, influencing culture across the Commonwealth um, and and staying a, staying a positive culture throughout 70 years, no controversies, no no um no mishaps no i mean sure there was probably some mistakes along the way and there's 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 lots of little things that but there was so much controversy around her and she seemed to just be this this vessel of peace and tranquility and even in her addresses and um and i thought you know going there's a couple of things that i kind of i draw from it that would help me as a leader to be able to you know, going going on at what we spoke about previously, being influenced by you know, a, you know counterculture and, and things like that. You know, one thing obviously you mentioned is her faith. You know, having a strong faith. We we said you know, know what you stand for, like having a strong faith. Also, notice that she never commented on political issues. She never when that when there was all the issues with with. Princess Diana and and you know Prince Charles and all those all those dramas, she never actually spoke up about them. Even in her, in her address after Prince Diana died, she just focused on the positives about Princess Diana, not not trying to bring disrepute to people. And and it kind of goes back to what you said said previously about just you know loving people and and caring about the individual. Um, it seems like I, what I see is what what gave her strength to last seventy years without major controversy, without you know wavering and and stuff like that. Is obviously her faith, but also just staying in her lane, not getting caught up with gossip or 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 controversy or trying to trying to force her way into into the spotlight. Like you, you see all these people that are making comments and making fools of themselves and doing all this stuff to try to, you know, force themselves into the spotlight where well, she did none of that and yet stayed in the spotlight for 70 years. What's your take on, on, on those, those key attributes of, you know, being able to withstand culture and, and maintain a, a strong culture? Well, you mentioned a little earlier, Craig, that we need to know what it is that God wants us to stick up for. Yeah. Uh, we need to have a good idea, you know, pick our battles. Those are the things that God has uniquely equipped us for and he's called us to to, um, to engage in them. 
And look, I, I think Queen Elizabeth II had a very strong understanding of her vocation. Mm. Um, I've actually got a quote before me. And look, I, I've got this quote because I spent a few days preparing a sermon on, um, on uh, Queen Elizabeth as a, as a great example of somebody who had developed uh, resilience. But um, Carl, uh, yeah, Carl Truman, Professor of Biblical and Religious Studies at Grove City College in Pennsylvania, he, he wrote this um, very recently, actually. It was uh, just about a week ago in a blog. A friend who once had the privilege of being a royal chaplain and spending a weekend at Balmoral Castle confirmed that the conversations he had with the Queen revealed her to be a thoughtful, devout Christian. As a humble Christian, she took her earthly vocation seriously, placing the needs of the office and of the people she ruled uh, before her own. So I think for her, a really key thing was that she knew what her vocation was. And she really didn't step outside, if you like, the boundaries of that, that vocation. And uh, I know this is a big thing for you. This is a big thing for me as well in um, helping people understand what it is that God has called them to. Yeah. She had a firm understanding of what it was that God had called her to. Mm. And, uh, you know, our, our desire is that Christians everywhere would have a similar depth of understanding. Because I can tell you what, when the going gets tough, if you know for sure and certain that you've responded to the vocational call on your life, you can put up with a lot. And uh, you mentioned, of course, that, that there were so many controversies uh, surrounding her family, even the role of the monarchy. Um, you know, three out of her four children ended up divorcing and there was all kinds of um, publicity and scandal surrounding those. More recently, of course, uh, Prince Andrew has um, been involved in, in all kinds of scandal. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, she didn't come out swinging in public about the criticism against her personally or about criticism of the monarchy because that was not consistent with her vocational call. Mm. But she did do some things that were remarkable that perhaps aren't reported on a lot. Mm -hmm. So, for example, she's the first sovereign that I'm aware of, uh, certainly in British history, who paid income tax. Really? So even though she was queen, she did. Wow. Uh, about 30 years ago or so, she agreed to, to pay income tax, even though the royal family earned for Great Britain far, far more in terms yes. of tourism dollars uh -huh. than they would ever cost uh, the budget. Mm -hmm. um, but so she broke with a long, long tradition going over very many, you know, many hundreds of years. So she paid income tax because, by the way, she did build up a significant wealth portfolio in her own right. Yeah. So she was a very wealthy woman because of pretty wise investments that she herself had made. Uh, the other thing she did, which we were talking about um, before we, we rolled the camera, Craig, in 1970, when she was on a tour of Australia, she broke with tradition of hundreds of years. And as queen, she just strolled with the people. So she mingled. And uh, she was the first monarch ever to have done that, mm -hmm. except perhaps during the Second World War when her important role models, her mother and father, um, walked among the ruins of, of London um, with, with, with the people. So um, there were times, I think, when, when she made very significant decisions that changed the nature of the monarchy, but that was well within if you like, the boundaries of the vocation that God had called her to. But she was very scrupulous about those boundaries and she just never went outside them. And going back to what she actually said on her, on her uh, um, inauguration speech, that she's there to serve. She's there That's for right. service yeah. of yeah. people. And we as leaders, we have, to, we have to have that servant heart. We have to go out intentionally knowing that we are there serving God. And how do we serve God? We serve the people he's called us to lead. He hasn't called us to rule over people. He hasn't called us to, because if we want to rule over people, that's putting ourselves in a kingdom position. And there's only one person that should be sitting in that kingdom position. And it's, it's amazing to see that 
that someone can stay true to their faith, stay true to their convictions, their you know, and stick in their culture and influence positively the culture around them for 70 years because she served, she intentionally served people. She kept her mouth shut, you know, like like what I don't, and you know, I'm not saying that like keep your mouth shut, you know, like she she knew when when to speak and and what not to speak and she held herself with integrity and she had that incredible faith, incredible faith. And we as leaders can learn so much from Queen Elizabeth II and thank God for her. Um, thank God for her um, ru- ruling symbolically and leading the way and being able to influence culture um, so positively. Um, there's, n- I, I doubt there'd be very few people, well, there's not many people on the planet, let alone the you know in history, that so many people would have such good things to say about this one person over over such a long career. So. You know, um, we pray that she rests in peace and that uh, that she is up in heaven uh, enjoying her time with Jesus right now, reaping the rewards of her service. Um, well, we, we all know she's not up there yet, but, you know, in her timeline, she's up there now. <laughs> well, um, it's really hard to kind of transition from that because it's such a such a beautiful story into let's let's you've watched a quick excerpt well actually we know we talk a little bit so it's not that quick but you've watched an excerpt from our weekly live full episode of on the cube leadership podcast if you want to see what more you can learn to become a better leader from pop culture from business from politics from uh, ministry leadership and from the bible uh, we encourage you hit the subscribe button and join us as we continue to share more and more information like this so that you can become a better leader that learns, lives and leads on purpose.